Welcome. Uh, my name is Doug Fink. I host the PowerShell virtual meetup here in New York City. And I'm looking forward to Heiko Bren. He's going to be talking about leveling up our PowerShell game with Script Runner. He works at Script Runner. Um, he also likes ACDC. So I figured I'd play a little Thunderstruck, uh, which was a little better. Let's do a little bit of housekeeping and uh, then we'll jump right in. Should be really good. I'm looking forward to checking this stuff out. Uh, so do my own plugging. So tomorrow, one o'clock Eastern time on the East Coast, I'm going to be doing a live exploration of the new features in OpenAI uh, GPT-4. Specifically, I'm going to look at the uh, GPT Vision and I'm going to upload things like pictures and actually do some analysis and actually have it generate PowerShell code from pictures. So if you're interested in that, come on down. Um, just as a quick note, and I'll paste this into um, the chat. I post all my live explorations, other videos, and the stuff from the meetup here in on my YouTube channel. So uh, if you want, you can head over there. And if you hit the subscribe button, I think that should work. If not, let me know. If you hit the subscribe button notification, you'll know when I post these meetings. And tomorrow, if you can't make it or if you want to check it out some other time, you'll get notified when I post that as well. Um, also, I post videos uh, that I do on all different types of things like Copilot X, GPT-4, other large language models, et cetera. So something to check out. So and also another piece at the end of the month, Yep. On Halloween, I'm going to do a lunch and learn with the folks in the UK. And on that, I'm going to talk again about OpenAI, but with an, from a perspective of uh, Azure and Azure OpenAI service and how that is different, the same as OpenAI in general. Um, so if you found this through the meetup, uh, you can check it out. You may have been notified already when I published that, or you can check it out and you can RSVP and uh, go from there. And next month, um, going to have somebody come on and talk about one of my favorite topics, which is PowerShell and Excel. Uh, on she has done a whole bunch of work with time series forecasting and impact estimation using PowerShell and my Microsoft Excel module. Um, so if that stuff interests you, or if it doesn't, but you want to see how to use, like, do some cool things, join us next month. That's also up on the meetup uh, and you can RSVP is there as well. Okay. Uh, so that's the YouTube channel. That's the meetups coming. Let's uh, bring that up one more time. So tonight, uh, Heiko has uh, been generous enough to he's up late tonight and uh, he's over in Belgium. I hope I got that right. And he'll be talking about some stuff with script runner. Um, he's the, script runner expert and head of international business. And uh, you can catch him on Twitter if he wants to post uh, his, his handle there. And he also does a lot of posting on uh, LinkedIn about lots of cool stuff that he finds as well as what's going on inside of script runner. Um, and with that, Heiko, if you're ready to go. Uh... Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Can you share your yeah. screen? Do I need to enable you or you're good to go? Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's try. Let's try. Let's try. Let's try. Ah, yeah. Oh, I think I need to turn mine off. Maybe. So. Okay. No good. All right. Let me. That looks. That should be fine, right? Um, nope. I think I'm, I don't have mine <laughs> I'm having some, oh, there we go. Let me click. There we go. You're up and ready. Okay. Awesome. Perfect. Take it away. Yeah. So yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Doug, for the introduction. Actually, I'm, I'm based in Germany, so it's almost Belgium. <laughs> Sorry uh, about that. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you know, it's Europe. So let's call it <laughs> Europe. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Great seeing, um, you playing ACDC. So that's, uh, that's cool. awesome. That's awesome. So um, yeah, I'm happy to be here. 
to talk about um, PowerShell and Script Runner and how I think yesterday I think you posted something. You, you wrote uh, automate the PowerShell automation, and I liked it a lot. So so I hope I can give everyone a little insight on yeah what Script Runner can do for you if you are using PowerShell today and what kind of uh, maybe next level things you could do if you if you use PowerShell in combination with Script Runner. And um, yeah, so I will uh, have a, a couple of slides. And oh, there's someone joining from 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 Nuremberg. So some someone someone else is is up late or early. However you wanna you wanna see it. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, yeah. Before we start, so I already put uh, my contact information into the into the chat. So and talking about ACDC, right? So you can see there is I have some. I'm a fan. Let's put it this way. So just give you a little little background. So yes, I'm responsible for everything in Script Runner that happens in North America, Benelux, and Scandic. Um, yeah, I've been in the IT industry for quite a while. Uh, different, um, yeah, different positions. I call myself a PowerShell enthusiast, which for, which for me is totally different from being an expert. So I'm really... I admire everyone who's doing a lot of great stuff with PowerShell. And uh, the first time I, I was uh, working with PowerShell was back in the day with Exchange 2007, um, quite a while ago. And um, together with with Ryan, we uh, we co-founded also a PowerShell user group over here in Germany. Um, and um, I think I have one slide at the end um, with an upcoming session with um, Gail Colas. He will talk about T SQL, SQL, and and PowerShell in November. But um, yeah, that's another another topic. Again, if you want to get in touch with me, I'm as dark as you said. I'm I'm kind of active on Twitter. I'm pretty active on on uh, LinkedIn, and you can reach me also, of course, via email. I have a little um, YouTube channel as well where I post things, also in regards to our PowerShell user group. Okay, so maybe let's start with uh, giving some introduction into the company. So this is part of our team trying to line up in the PowerShell logo. Um, as I said, we are we are we are based in Germany. We've been around since 2014. We're about 25 people at the moment, and we have about 1,900 scripts on our GitHub repo for all kinds of platforms. So if you're looking for inspiration, for ideas, what you could do with PowerShell, you can find them on uh, github.com slash scriptrunner slash action packs. And um, I will also post this into the chat. It's every everything like Active Directory, Exchange, Office 65, Azure, VMware, Citrix, um, so you find all kinds of different um, examples that you can just download, yeah, and uh, of course modify for, for yourself. So that's one thing that we, uh, how we, um, yeah, kind of support people using PowerShell. A another way is we have a, a bunch of PowerShell goodies. We have a PowerShell poster, kind of a, a cheat sheet for your office wall, like get help for your office wall. And actually, we just released an update, which is not, not only has a, a nice a new design, but also some very new, interesting content. We added some PowerShell 7 stuff, for example. We added some Exchange stuff. Um, so yeah, if you can go to our website here and get the poster. We have a security ebook for PowerShell. We have a cheat sheet for Teams and for Exchange as well. So if you would like to check this out, um, again, I will put it into the chat. So just go there and um, yeah, you, um, it, yeah. Especially the poster, we see people having it at, hanging on the wall and it's uh, for, for, your daily, for, the, for your daily business, it's really helpful. And you, of course, you also get a PDF. So if you want to just copy and paste things out of uh, and use it as a, from this perspective, you can also get the PDF, of course. Um, all right, so with this, um, let's talk about um, Script Runner and PowerShell and what the combination can, can do for you. So I want to start with, with two pictures here. So we, when I talk to people using PowerShell, um, you know, no matter how big the organizations are, sometimes it looks like this, where you have a whole bunch of scripts 
all yeah in different places written by different people and for the people who wrote the scripts it's it's perfect because they typically hopefully know what they do and where they are um but if you think about this scenario being something where you say okay i have a script that does an onboarding and i would like to delegate this to someone maybe in my team or maybe even help those people or i would like to delegate things like creating an out of office when somebody calls in sick that could be even a, a kind of a self-service thing or something that you would like to delegate to hr for example or what you would like to automate um when it comes to schedule stuff then this kind of approach might be a little bit challenging and so the idea of a script runner is to turn everything that you do with powershell where you have your scripts your modules your credentials the connections to the backend systems that you want to manage into something that's well organized that is secure to use where you can say this is the the use case to start onboarding to spin up a new vm to create a shared mailbox or whatever and then use it yourself or give it to someone else and having having a secure way of of doing that and uh, you will see later on that one of the main theme around all that is centralization so that you are really in control about all the stuff that happens with your existing PowerShell scripts and with the scripts that you um, hopefully want to create in the future. And we will also see that now, of course, uh, uh, Doug already, of course, mentioned ChatGPT and AI. So I also will, will show you a few things where we have an integration with ChatGPT that can help, for example, to create PowerShell scripts from scratch and maybe modifying existing scripts. So I will, I will show you this as well. So uh, one step further. So what does that mean? Now we, we have a general context. When you use um, Script Runner and PowerShell, it's all about standardizing and automating and delegating all kinds of tasks as long as they're built on, on PowerShell. And then you have three ways of triggering the scripts. And I will show you uh, examples for each of these possibilities. One is interactive, meaning you want to delegate it to a junior admin, to help desk teams, to end users. Um, the second one is schedule, meaning you would like to get maybe rid of all your Windows task scheduler stuff that happens on many different boxes and you're not really in control about did it, does it work, does it not work. And the third way is event driven, meaning you can trigger the execution of scripts from other third party solutions like ServiceNow, SAP. Jira, SharePoint workflows, basically every every system that is able to talk REST and can authenticate in Script Runner, you can enable to trigger scripts here in in Script Runner. And why would you do? Why would you like to do that? One reason is that you have a centralized monitoring and reporting, so you can see in detail what actually um, happened. And I have a little screenshots here, but I will show you, of course, this also later on in in my environment. But this is how the reports looks like, where you can see in detail which script got triggered by which user, what backend system has been has been used, what have been the parameter input, what was the outcome, no matter if, like in this case, it was successful or maybe if the execution failed. Um, so you get all this information about the, the execution of your scripts. Then there is also a statistics that shows you and tries to answer at least the question like how much time and money did we actually save by automating and the third way is um, we're having a live monitor where you can see what's happening right now so this is kind of a view into the underlying powershell hosts to see what's what's happening there including the option to cancel the execution if something maybe takes too long or you simply don't you don't need this execution um, anymore, then you can click on the red button, and then um, the execution will 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 end. And that that's because it's never a user or a system that runs the script. It's always the script on a server that runs in your environment, on prem or in the cloud. Um, but it's not a user. So the user, and you will see this later on. The user is telling the script on a server to run the script with the user's input. But everything around the PowerShell logistics, if you will, happens centrally and that's why um yeah we can provide and you can you can use this monitoring piece to see actually what's 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 happening what happened and what's happening right now and it's it all starts with centralizing your scripts and modules so 
instead of having them again in different places, uh, you can create a centralized reporting with our script on a portal. So here we have we see a, a list of, of scripts here in in the screenshot. Then you can also use things like our uh, the, the code editor, web-based code editor, which allows you to check out check in scripts, see the change history. This is of course helpful if you're not using things like Git or Azure DevOps or Bitbucket or things like that. Um, so this is for organizations who would want to start developing and maintaining scripts with multiple people, multiple teams maybe even. But of course, if you're using things like GitHub and Azure DevOps, then of course you can synchronize your scripts to the script runner server. And then you typically would not enable the code editor because this obviously would kind of undermine your centralized approach and your pipeline. Talking about um, centralization, of course, the credentials that we, we, we need to connect to your backend system are also managed centrally. And uh, so that means that the credentials that could be, of course, user password, other client secret could be SSH keys to manage Linux boxes with, with PowerShell 7, for example. You can, again, manage them in the portal here. And they can, store, can be stored in two ways, either locally on the script on a server, or uh, another option is to use password servers. So we have connectors to CyberArk, Blessant, and Psychotic at the moment. And this means if you only have the credentials in the password, in, the, in your password walls, then of course there will be no local credentials at all. In practice, it's typically hybrid. So, so customers have credentials, some credentials stored locally in the Windows credential store and others are, are coming from and being used from the from the um, password servers. And um, as a little um, sneak peek, so to speak, so we will support Azure Key Vault in one of the next releases. That's that's uh, very high on the roadmap. And um, so that, that will help to yeah, further, especially obviously if you're using Azure, then that, that's a natural thing and will be another way of uh, interacting with, with Script Runner. When we talk about the delegation part and, and, and things that I will show you later on, it, it's about delegation where you take a task that's based on a PowerShell script and you want to give it to someone else that probably, probably has maybe never heard about PowerShell, but you don't want to train about PowerShell, uh, about PowerShell and where even more important, you don't want to give these people any kind of privileged permissions just to allow them to, let's say, do a password reset, change an out of office setting or creating a shared mailbox, things like that. And um, so what happens here uh, when you use PowerShell together with Script Runner is that PowerShell itself happens here in what we call the Script Runner zone. So Script Runner, has access to the scripts, to the credentials, to the modules and the systems that you want to manage. So this is where PowerShell happens. Now, when if you want to enable users or other systems to trigger the execution of scripts, they don't have to touch this backend systems, meaning, of course, they also don't need to have any privileged permissions. So you have a complete separation between the PowerShell context and the PowerShell logistics, so to speak, and, and the delegation part, because what you do instead, you use the script runner policies, the script runner configuration, where you decide which kind of delegation, which kind of tasks you would like to make available to a specific team in your organization. And this is where we talk about AD groups, Azure AD groups, of course, where you, how, this is how you manage that. And, um, and then, the next step we will see that, of course, when we talk about this scenario, we don't want people to be on the command line and then typing things and uh, making typos and whatever. And um, so that's why these people, they work with the portal, which is just a web-based um, representation of everything that, that runs behind the scenes based on your PowerShell scripts. And yeah, so this is for, for many organizations is kind of a, a key aspect of actually taking PowerShell out of this expert circle area, if you will, uh, and make it something where maybe the, the whole organization can benefit from. So yes, it's based on PowerShell, but the way it's presented, of course, is different. 
uh, it's easy. It's uh, something that everybody can use. And one and the reason why that is possible is that if you use um, script runner, it automatically turns every PowerShell script into a web form. And that could look like this. So what happens is that we in real time, it, script runner is analyzing your scripts. It looks into the synopsis, it looks into the parent block and the script runner configuration. And based on that, it turns it into something that you see here on the right side, which is uh, yeah, just a web form where you can decide which kind of parameters you should, uh, you want to display what, um, where do you want to have just plain text fields where people can just type or where you want to map your parameters with, with queries where you, they can pick and choose from a list of users, list of VMs, list of printers, list of whatever. Um, and also, of course, being able to say, okay, I have an organization with different regions and the people in on the East Coast should be able to work with all the, op the users um, of the East Coast and the, the, the West Coast people should only be working with the, be able to work with the users or groups or printers or whatever of the of the West Coast region. And that's exactly what you can do with the script runner configuration, which kind of lies on top of your scripts as this management layer. And um, so you can have all these different scenarios. And the nice thing about that, you can do all that without the need of changing the underlying scripts. Um, because this is where, when you have these different roles, different responsibilities, this is exactly what you can do uh, in the script runner configuration. And that's, of course, what we're going to look at um, right now, because enough of slides. Let's go to um, my environment, which hopefully is still up and running somewhere. So I have to see where it is. And if we're lucky, yeah, it looks good. I will move this over right here. So yeah, let's start a little. Um, run through what that what I just showed you in theory what does that mean in in practice so here we are in the script on a portal it's a role based portal so here i'm logged in as a script on administrator meaning i can add scripts delegations use cases which we, by the way we call actions you will hear this term um more often throughout this uh, this talk and um, we will also later on, we will also switch to a delegation role, which looks totally different because, yeah, you want to hide all the stuff that has to do with PowerShell and just focus on the use case. But as an, as an super administrator, for example, I have this dashboard here, and then I can have an overview about the things that, 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 that happen or happens right now. Then I have the monitoring area, which we'll take a look at. We have the configuration and we have some settings and um, we'll start with the configuration because yeah, it typically all starts with the script. So here I can see, I have access to all the scripts that are part of my current configuration. Um, I have about, you can see that here to, to kind of 1200 scripts for all kinds of different use cases. Uh, we can work with filters here. You can say, I only want to see my, Azure scripts, for example, and then the whole view is chain is kind of yeah only showing everything around uh, 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 that based on on Azure, for example. It's very easy to add um, new scripts right here. So here you can add just upload scripts that you already have. Then of course you can also create new scripts either totally from scratch or for example I mentioned these scripts that we have on GitHub. So here, for example, you could say, okay, I want to have a script that helps me to add users to groups. Then here you have access to this scripts, or to this, to this specific script on GitHub. And you can say, okay, that's fine. I want to make it part of my configuration. And then it becomes, uh, it, it's downloaded and then you can yeah, modify it um, and work with it wherever you want. And as I mentioned, um, we have this uh, yeah ChatGPT integration as well since uh, yeah a, a few months actually. And what this allows you to do is to have a very simple prompt like this one here. And um, if Chat if ChatGPT is in a good mood, 
then um, we would we should get back a script and not just the code itself. What we should get back might take a little bit is a well structured PowerShell script that has a synopsis that and you will see that we have and it al already has some script on a specific information that helps to optimize the script uh, to to use it with script runner one thing for example is we support multi-language scenarios where you could later on you will see if i'm switching let's say from english to spanish and the description should change then this information um, can be uh, or is is kind of part of the script and the synopsis here so here you can see number one we have a synopsis and here you can see that we work with this language prefixes that lets us know if somebody switches to Spanish, for example, that's what we should um, create. Now, with this simple sentence, I want to create a new Active Directory, that's what you get. So I think that that's pretty cool because you not, number one, you're not starting from scratch. And in our case, it's already shows you things that is kind of a value add to the default PowerShell, which is in this case, yeah, the language stuff. Then you have a parent block, obviously, uh, we tell them, okay, we want to use splatting. So we have a nice, nice script here. And um, also it already adds some specific variables here, uh, with, which is the result message, which is a one way to control what the user will see after an execution. Again, either if it's successful or not successful. That's why also we, of course, we have a try catch and finally sections. Um, so I think that's pretty cool because um, instead of starting with a blank page, you already have something to start with. And I would say, is it perfect? Probably not. Um, does it help you to um, speed up the way you create new scripts? I would say absolutely yes. My experience is as long as they are modules that are out there for quite some time, which of course is true for AD. For exchange for VMware, I would I my experience is the results are pretty good. If you try to with MS Graph, I would say maybe not so good at the moment, based on on the information that is part of uh, of the of the of the language model. But um, yeah, it's 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 I think it's a great companion. That's how I call it, and um, it, it it's really a cool thing. And of course, if you have an existing script. Um, in your configuration, you can easily go to the code editor, but you can also see the uh, the parameters here, and you can see, uh, yeah, the details here. You could check out a script. You can see the changes. You could change the change history if we would have one. So if we would go to another, to a uh, maybe to another script, you will see that that this is something that um, yeah helps you to organize the way that you work with your scripts and you can see the diff between old an old version and a new version you could even go back so again this is a scenario if you're not using things like git or azure devops or things like that then of course um that is a that is a good way to start having multiple people working with with your with with scripts adding scripts and modifying existing scripts and um yeah it's i think it's a it's a nice uh user interface and um there is by the way there is also for this check out check in mechanisms there is also a an add-on for vs code and also still for the good old ise so there's also something that you can do here um as well and yeah then let's talk credentials so of course we need the credentials to connect to the backend systems here and as I said, credentials can be different things, user password combinations, other client secrets, could be SSH keys. And um, so in my case, many of these credentials are stored locally in the credential store, but some of them are also stored in a password server, meaning if we if Scripton needs it, it will ask the password server in real time to get the information to um, use this to connect to your backend system. And that's happening happens, happens in the next step in what we call the targets. These are the systems that you would like to manage. 
which can be anything as long as it can be done on with PowerShell. So as you can see, it's, it's, it, it follows the PowerShell basics, um, possibilities, local execution, PowerShell remoting. You, you see a couple of um, yeah, frequently used cloud services, of course, of 65 and, and Azure, but it's of course not limited to that. It's just to make it easier to work with this uh, inside of the configuration here. And if we look at a very simple example, talking to AD, what is a target? It is a combination of what systems do we want to connect to and what kind of credential are we going to use to connect to this system? And that means with this, mapping, so to speak, later on, whenever we use this target script knows what to do. We know where to connect to, we know which credential should be used. So this information doesn't have to be in your scripts anymore because again, if you select this ADZ remote target later on, the script knows what to do. And also if you need to change that and you use this target in many different places, you only have to change it once in this target configuration, then everything is updated automatically. And um, if we take a look at, for example, an Office 65 target, which in this case is, is, is Exchange Online, so I can say which kind of um, service I would like to manage. And again, what kind of credential should I use? I could be certificate-based, could be user password. And if I'm going for, for example, MS Graph, if I go here, you will see that um, here I have the app registration. So that's how you, again, tell script runner, again, where to connect to and what kind of secret credential, whatever, uh, should be used. And also in this case, it, uh, it it's uh, also configured that we only want to load the mail module. Um, so again, also that doesn't need to be in your scripts anymore. Um, because um, the target knows that okay, we need to it needs to load this module, so you can just focus on on the actual um, yeah business code, so if you will, yeah. And so you can create an unlimited number of targets for all the systems that you want to manage. The next step here I want to talk about are the queries. So the queries are here to make sure the users don't have to type; they can select from lists, from drop-down lists that you provide. And these queries can be based on everything around Active Directory, around Azure, could be graph queries. You can create scripted queries, which is a very flexible way of pulling together data from different sources, SQL databases, CRM systems, or whatever. And um, let's say if we look at an example of an, of an AD query here, what does this look like? Um, we can click on the on the start button on the on the test button here, and um, we will see a result, which shows us two things: the parameter value and the display value. And that means the display value that's what the user sees, and the parameter value is always what is being used later on when the actual script is being executed. And that's a pretty cool thing because right here, okay, we get we come back with one value, which is the which is the name. Um, but what you could do also, you could create queries where you say, okay, I want to have a whole bunch of attributes and I want to use them. And that's exactly what you can do here. Um, so if you're later on, if you, for example, if, you, if you're working with splitting here, so what you can do here again, for the, from the user perspective later on, when we look at from the delegation perspective, we will still see the same display value. It's the user and the email address. But the data that we can use in the background, in this case, is um, a JSON object that contains the department, the email address, the company, things like that. So you can pull together a lot of information uh, with just one query and then use it in your in your underlying script. And I think that's 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 uh, a pretty cool thing. And yeah, so and the overall idea of queries is avoid people typing things and explaining how a structure of a, of some information like an email address should look like, but instead let them select from a list. And again, if you have people with different responsibilities, of course you can have a query that comes back with all the users from a, from a, the East coast and another query that comes back with all the users from the West coast. And then you map it to the right action, the use case. 
uh, and delegate it to the right group of people, um, which actually brings us to the next point, which are the actions. The actions are the, the brackets, so to speak, around all these different business pieces. So we, we looked at scripts, credentials, targets, and queries. Um, alone, just as, as these entities, they are not really helpful, but if we to put them together into an action, then this is something that you can start to delegate, that you can start to automate, that, that you can trigger via, via REST connectors. And, and so that's the use case. And so we from, from now on, we will talk, we will focus on, on exactly this, this actions. And before we go into the details here, I want to switch the, the role and show you how that looks like now if I am on the receiving end, if I am a user which I want to enable to let's say do a password reset um, as, a, as a very simple example and so I will switch the browser and the row so I go, will go to this uh, browser here and now I'm logged in as a help desk user and as a help desk user I can do two things I can work with actions that have been delegated to me so each tile represents a use case you can see you can work with color schemes and icons to make it easy for the user to understand, to see what this is all about. And as we talk about PowerShell, of course, technically it can be anything that you can build with your PowerShell script. The number of tiles I see here really depends on the configuration script runner. And maybe there will be users, uh, users only have maybe two or three or five or six tiles available. Others maybe have 20, 50, depending on their role. And um, so that's how you make the, this available, maybe for a junior admin or a help desk person. And what I also can do as a in, in this role, I can take a look at the report, which is not a global report for everything, but is is a report that shows what I have done um, in the past. For example, I created a report of all my VMs, for example, or I can go back and uh, maybe I created. Um, a, an Active Directory report, and I want to go back and, and take a look at it. And so, so this is kind of a subset of the overall reporting, only focusing on the user that is logged in right now. But the main part, of course, is the, is the run area here, which if we start with this really simple example to show you the overall concept, um, if this would be a password reset scenario, I can click on the tile here, what do I see? I see a description here of what this is all about. Um, this is markup, so you can work with all kinds of formatting if you want to. And then what I can do here, I can I can see, well, actually I can see three parameters, the OU, the user, and I have to enter a password manually in this case. Now, instead of you know typing CN equals whatever, this is the first uh, query that we see here. It's uh, It shows us the OU and in the second, area here for the users. Now I can pick the users of this OU. If I'm switching to another OU, then also dynamically this result list is also changing. So this is how you can lead the users through, like in this case, a two-step process or it could be three, four, whatever the process um, looks like. The idea is no typing for the user and being in control, what the user is able to select. So, in case of someone would only be responsible for the uh, this uh, USA um, OU, I can predefine that. I can hide that, and so all I can see and all I can work with are the users and and the the, the objects in this list, and um, nothing can be changed. So this is again coming back to okay, if you have different people with different roles, this is how you can control that. Third parameter, password. So notice in the lower left corner, we have this play button. It's grayed out. And that's because at the moment, I have not done everything correctly. Oops. Because I need to have a number and a special character and a specific length. And only if that is all correct, I can click on the run button. Now that's done with a validate pattern. And I'll show you the underlying script in a second that is checking a regular expression to make sure that the input is correct. So instead of running something, coming back with an error, these things can be checked before somebody is, is uh, running a script. And that's, I think, is, is, is of course, pretty helpful. So now we did everything correct. I can click on the Run button. And now in the background, Script Runner is executing um, this script. And um, 
it will come back with a hopefully with a little message in this case plain text message saying okay yes part of reset was successful let's take a look at the underlying script of this uh, use case of this action um so what you can see number one um there are multiple language information meaning if i go back and i switch here from english to spanish for example you can see the descriptions are also changing so this is from information is directly related to this part if we go to the parent block we can see we have a validate links and a validate pattern right here and that's exactly what's what's being checked while the user is typing something in the in the password field and um, so that's checked in real time so again pretty helpful thing to make sure um yeah people are doing the right thing and so based on that concept you now of course thinking about other use cases it can be something like um creating an out of office for and delegating this to hr for example and you have a template for notifications and because in the underlying script we have a date time parameter that's automatically translated into a date picker for example and um yeah we can we can run it so by the way i can just close it and i can go back to i can go to to the next execution because in the background it still runs that of course um then let's say you have a scenario where you say okay yes i want people to change maybe op properties of a user and um so i want to talking about acdc i want to use uh want to select this user angus and you say okay yeah yeah cool we want us we want people to be able to to edit some parameters but they also should see more information about user but it should be read only and that is exactly what you can do right here there are specific help message parameters one is called read only that allows you to display information like all this stuff here but i cannot change it so the only thing i could change uh is the is the user title so that that enables you to make sure that only the properties that actually should be um yeah should be changed by a user that's exactly what they see so again can be controlled and is controlled by what you do um with your inside of your scripts for example and so again based on that it can be you know sp spinning up new vms in very specific regions with very specific sizes here again we have queries that helps you to guide the user and make sure they're doing the right thing and not in this case spinning up the most expensive vm for example so this is how you present this use case in the portal now another way of doing that is um taking individual use cases or actions as we call them and integrate them into an existing website so what you can do here is you could say okay uh, i have an intranet page i have a sharepoint website i have a self-service portal or whatever and then you can say okay um this is where i want to include this use case and so what you can see here it's the exact same functionality as it's in the portal because the backend is exactly the same it's just a different way of the representation in the uh on on the front end side and it's now it's of course even easier to access of course the user also has have has to authenticate so we can check if the user is allowed to work with this specific use case or not by the way down here this would be an example of okay there is no selection of any ou there are only the objects of the OU UK because that's what's predefined in the background. So all I can do is exactly doing that, working with the objects that are part of my responsibility, my region, my role, uh, for example. So that's uh, an even easier way of, of triggering and making this, let's say, PowerShell available for people who have no idea that there's some PowerShell in the background it's just an input form but everything is in the background of course is done based on your based on your PowerShell scripts now let's take a look at how this is configured um let's go to what we just ran uh the first time which was the, the password reset so let's let's open an action because as I said this action is kind of the the center point of 
everything that you would like to automate, that you would like to delegate, where you want to have statistics and reportings for. So here, first of all, we have an overview about, okay, what script is being used? Do we have some queries involved here, which is the case? What are the systems that we want to connect to? So in this case, it's just one. It could be multiples, of course. And do we have some delegations already configured? If we go to the script section, what you can see here is all the parameters that are part of the underlying script. And we can see we have mandatory parameters. Here we can see, here is the mapping to this queries in the background. So meaning instead of just having a text field where I would have to type whatever, I map this to the query that fits the use case. And the second one, the username, again, another query, plus I have a, configured a search space, meaning the list of users depends on what I've selected here, uh, what, what kind of OU I've selected. So, and this is the two-step approach for this use case. And I have the password. It already show, it shows the, the validate pattern and validate length. And so for example here, what we didn't see is the information of, okay, should the user uh, be forced to change a password or not? So typically that's how it's set. Let's say you would say, okay, I want the user to decide when they when they work with this action. Uh, what you can do is you can say, okay, I'm unhiding, I'm unhiding this property here by clicking on the button. If I'm going back and open this action again, now we will see that now this additional parameter becomes available. Now, in reality, of course, it's the other way around. Organizations try to hide as many as uh, parameters as possible because it makes it easier for the user and it helps you to make sure you have a standardized way of doing things no matter if it's triggered by user A, B, or C. Um, and um, so that's why you see a lot of uh, parameters here being hidden. You can see there's also one webhook URL parameter with some information and uh, the reason what and of course it's hidden. And the reason why that is part of this action is, is because what happened when I triggered this action after, uh, during the execution, what we did is um, we also automatically pushed some information into a Teams channel based on this configured webhook. So this is one way of proactively get some information across about maybe some, some critical processes where yes, sending out an email would be another way, of course, but this is, I think, a more proactive way. And what you can see here is, for example, we have this information about, okay, which user triggered this execution from which IP it got triggered. So this information becomes part and can be used for this kind of direct communication into a specific Teams channel, for example. So that's why we see the, the webhook URL here. Yeah, then we have the targets, the systems that we want to connect to, of course. And you can decide if you want to run Windows PowerShell or PowerShell 7. You can predefine and you can preload library scripts. So if you have functions, so for example, the, the function to push this message to a Teams channel is part of this library script. And instead of having it in multiple scripts, I have it in one library script and I tell this action to preload this library script with the underlying function. So I just I can just call it from my main script. And um, of course that helps also to maintain everything around this library scripts. One place where you want, need me maybe add um, functions or maybe modify functions um, makes the whole life easier when it comes to maintaining everything around functions. Okay, and then here delegation, meaning here I have a whole bunch of uh, roles based on my, on in my case, AD groups, could be Azure AD groups. And um, so based on that, that this, this, is, this is where you decide which users should see this tile reset password for Active Directory user. That is exactly where you make this decision. And then here you have a, an additional uh, language settings that you can use here and where you can set the colors and icons and stuff like that. And that's how you configure an interactive um, action for, for a script runner. Now in another scenario, of course, you could say, yes, I have a whole bunch of things I would like to do scheduled, which is, as I mentioned earlier on, one of the other main use cases why 
uh, organizations like using that is, okay, I want to create reports on, on, on in multiple um, automatically, for example, doing housekeeping, whatever the use case might be. And then of course I can activate the scheduling here. Like this means it runs every once a week or maybe you want things that should run every 30 minutes or twice a day or three times a, a month, things like that. You can and you can configure this right here. Then of course you would activate the email notification maybe only to get some info if something didn't work. And um, also of course, again, in this scenario, quite often we see in addition to the email scenario, the thing that we looked at right here, sending some information directly into a Teams channel. And, but this is how you can get all this schedule stuff uh, being configured. And um, the third way of, of triggering the scripts would be using connectors. So you see a, a bunch of product names here, Jira, SAP, ServiceNow. So in fact, we talk about uh, REST connectors. So whenever you have a system that is able to talk REST, you can use it and you can enable it to talk to script runner and execute a script in in script runner in a very basic scenario i can show you that right here because one of the things that is part of the of the uh initial installation of script runner is that it comes with a script that provides that creates all this json data that allows you to interact with the uh, script on the back end and trigger the execution. So what happens here is um, I am configuring what kind of actions I would like to trigger, what are the parameter names, what are the parameter values. And then I can, I, I call, I run this script, which is again, is part of the installation. And that is talks to my backend system. And ju just as I would be a user or scheduled process now, with yeah, script runner takes the action, the parameter names, the parameter values, and is executing the script in the background and comes back with some um, hopefully success message, or if not, we will see an error message. Um, but this is kind of a basic form of interacting with script runner based on uh, a REST connection, and we can see a lot of different scenarios out there where um, companies tying together script runner with all kinds of systems and where in the background script runner becomes this hub for all PowerShell activities. Even if the third party system is able to do some kind of PowerShell stuff, it would be still some cent decentralized stuff where, okay, I have it, I have the scripts in different places and um, analyzing debugging might become difficult. So here you have a centralized view on everything. And that's especially true now if we if we take a look at um, the monitoring, because if we go to the report section here, for example, I can see that, yeah, I can see all these different executions here and I can go into this one and it will show me, okay, so that's this is what I would have seen if I would have done it interactively. Um, that's what we saw on the command line. I can see it got triggered by a web service connector. I can see all the different parameters that have been used. And um, I can take a look at the thing, uh, let's say in what happens in the PowerShell host behind the scenes, so to speak. Um, if we take a look at the, the other examples that we triggered, like this one here, triggering an out of office, for example, or doing an out of office, uh, uh, setting resetting a password. Again, here we can see it got triggered by this user. We can see all the parameters that have been used. Um, I can see all the details of the execution. And that's, of course, especially interesting. Let's say if something didn't work. So what I could do is I could say, oh, show me everything where the, the execution didn't work. So I did a lot of testing with this specific guy here, which didn't work. And so or this one here. Uh, most probably we had some problems with connecting to my VMware system because it was not active, for example. So starting to analyzing why things didn't work also is of course helpful. You can work with all kinds of filters to find out. I wanna see every execution for a specific backend system, for example. And again, that's all possible because as I said, it's never a user who triggered the execution. It's always, or runs the script, it's always the script runner 
back end that does that. That's why we get all this information here. And if we go to the live monitor, let's let's trigger something that takes a little bit longer. Maybe we create a AD report here. Yeah, so we, if we go into the live monitor now, I can see, okay, this user triggered the execution here. I can go in here and now this is directly the live view into the PowerShell, underlying PowerShell host. And I could click on cancel the execution and then, um, yeah, script and I will stop running this script. Um, yeah, so this is, this is, I think, really a, uh, yeah, really enables you to be in control about all your different activities around your PowerShell scripts. Now, another thing that I want to show you is, um, let's say you have some, let's say some, some client side use cases. And I have one example here. I hope the VM is still here. Is it here? Yeah. So here I have a Windows client. And the goal here is to enable users to clean their local Teams cache, which is still, you know, deleting different folders in the background, stuff like that. So the idea here is, okay, I can enable some, some users where I delegate this use case to say, okay, you can, you can run this action. It should do two things. It should close my teams in the background. And then once that's done, it should delete all the folders in the background. So my team's cache is basically closed. And so, okay, okay. Now we have again, this little over the top message. Let's go to the plain text one, because it hurts my eyes. Um, so it tells me, yes, the team's cache has been um, deleted successfully. Now, what does that mean is that, okay, it, it's triggered from a specific user and from a specific machine. And we have, a variable SRX env dot um, starlet IP. Um, and um, this information helps us, of course, or helps you to, to remote into the machine where the user clicked on the tile. And that's something that you can do again with your, um, with your script. So if we go back into the configuration part, I hope I can find this script quickly. It's not a scheduled one. It's, and it's about cleaning a cache. Mm -hmm. If I'm writing everything correctly, clear teams cache, that could be the one. Let's go in here. Uh, let's take a look at the code. Yeah, so here, we in line 37 right here. So we have this SRX ENV started IP information. And then, yeah, I'm changing it to the host name. And then I take this information and I'm remoting into this machine and do whatever is necessary. So this is, for example, so in this case, okay, we 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 uh, we cleaned this uh, this Teams cache. In other scenarios, it could be deploying some software, changing some firewall policies, or whatever. So, um, I want to show you that because this is just one uh, or a different scenario where, um, yeah, you in you include client side activities, which I think is is also pretty pretty helpful. And then because. Uh, just to also to show you that as a little uh, fun thing, because we talked about ChatGPT, then of course I have a scenario where I'm using Duck's um, PowerShell AI module. Um, now, the, if that's a an edge case or if it's if it's a real a serious uh, use case, it's up to you. But the idea here is um, to provide an action where people can interact with ChatGPT not directly, but uh, wire a script on action and I could say okay um uh let's say list the top 10 PowerShell command lists uh yeah use markup for example and so the idea is to have why would someone do that maybe just because well <laughs> it's possible um it might be maybe because you would like to kind of manage the way people work with ChatGPT. 
uh, and you want to kind of document it. Oh, Bala. Okay. Okay. That's new. Okay. Maybe the com com communication doesn't work at the moment because I just actually tested it an hour ago. We'll see. Well, anyway, I can show you the, the, the result of, of a previous test because um, what? Ah, okay. Okay. Sometimes ChatGPT maybe is not in the best mood, whatever. So here we get the list. Okay. That's fine. Now let's say for whatever reason, I would type in Ico. Uh, and uh, why would I do that? This is just an example of, let's say someone would ask ChatGPT for things that you'd say as a company, as an organization, okay, I want, I don't want to allow people to, to do that. Um, because maybe it's, it has to do with some finance data or whatever. And so what happens here in the background is that, well, I have, number one, I have a script that, that communicates with JetGPT. Uh, um, that's uh, this one here. So what, what do we do? So, okay, we have a credential. That's the OpenAI key. That comes from the credential manager in ScriptRunner, of course. Um, then again, we see a webhook URL here, and that's because I'm documenting everything that happens here with JetGPT. So number one, the successful communication and the result. And if something didn't work as planned because somebody used something that we don't allow, for example. And, um, and then, yeah, right here. So here I'm preparing the, the message that if, if something didn't work, and here, of course, I'm loading the module. And then I'm taking the input from the from the action, and I'm sending it using using Duck's module and sending it out to ChatGPT, and coming back with this result message, with, which that's what we saw. And then I'm sending the data also additionally to this uh, Teams channel. And um, so the the reason why this this uh, when I typed Heiko, it didn't work because I have this very stupid little list of blocked words. So whenever I use that. Uh, it, it will it will stop uh, and coming back it comes back with this message so this is yeah just just an just an idea um how you can kind of kind of maybe uh control people or organizations using using chat gpt yeah so that's that's just a little fun thing um including uh yeah the the powershell ai module Okay, what else? Let me take a look at the list if I forgot to show you anything significant that we didn't talk about. Yeah, maybe something else if we, um, so we, we talked about this uh, portal widget, which is things like this, where you can directly interact with an action, which means every action has a unique ID and what you can do. So. We are, I already showed you, of course, you can trigger it via the REST API. Now, if you want to do something um, based on an interactive way, but already pre-populate some data, you could say, okay, I am triggering an action. Oh, it's difficult to see, right? It's this action 250, and I'm already passing the name of a VM. And just like just like we did with the with the connector part, but now if we do that, it's um, let's say you are someone a user is already is in a in an ITSM system and you want to interactively trigger something based on a predefined process in the background, which comes back with that's the name of the VM and that's what I want to do. I want to stop this VM. So these parameters can be pre-populated based on um, this, this URL. So that might be another um, useful scenario to help users to do the right thing. And you could even combine that with, uh, with a read-only parameter. And then that's all that is going to happen. And there's no way to, for the user to change this. Um, triggered execution and the and the parameters that you want to use or should be used for this particular uh, particular use case all right yeah so um i would say that would be my round trip around um script runner and um yeah so we kind of 
looked through all these different areas of the solution. And um, if you say, okay, that's uh, that's interesting. I would like to test it. That's of course what you can do. You can go to our website and you can download the software. You can actually also go to the Azure Marketplace because since August we have um, script runner in the marketplace. So you can very easily make this part of your Azure subscription. If you have some individual questions that you might not want to ask now, I would be happy to yeah, create a session and talk with you directly. If, if you are interested next week, I don't know if you have heard about that, the PSCon for you, here's the logo, um, is having its Minicon conference next Tuesday. And um, they're going to be interesting sessions from Steve Lee, for example, um, about DSC, the future of DSC. That's going to be very interesting. And i also going to have a little session about PowerShell and Script Runner um, you might want to join. And another thing we're, what, what we're doing and where Doug also was part of a while ago, we have monthly Ask Me Anything sessions with people from the PowerShell community. Next week, we have the pleasure to talk to Adam Bertram, AKA Adam the Automator. So that's going to be interesting. So if you want to join that. Uh, so the best way really is to maybe to, to follow me on Twitter or LinkedIn to, to get all this information. And also, as I mentioned at the very beginning, as uh, together with, with Ryan, I'm running the Power Shoes Group Reinecker over here. There will be another session on the 15th of November with, with Gail Colas. He want to talk, he will talk about PowerShell MS SQL and TSQL, simple group for PowerShell. That's going to be interesting as well. And with this, uh, are there any questions that came up? I didn't see any. Good stuff. Oh, there's a question from Mark. Ah, okay. I have a question about doing things like if the computer network is public, except in the new case. Okay. Maybe you could be a little bit more specific about what you would like to do. Do you want to? Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah. So if, if so, as I, as I showed you this client side action. So if a remoting connection is possible from where script runner is running, then you could, of course, manipulate, edit the settings of your, of your machines. Um, maybe something I, I didn't show you when we talked about, maybe go back here when we talked about this target. So targets is always, okay, where, do, where do we can, where do we need to connect to, or where do we want to connect to now, depending on the infrastructure, security settings, direct connections might not always be possible. That's why, of course, there could be a jump host in between, or there could be a Chia endpoint or things like that. And then um, you can you can configure this as well in Script Runner and kind of, so that Script Runner kind of follows the way your infrastructure works and um, the, the, the security layers. And also, of course, depending on where you put Script Runner, um, in your infrastructure um, so it can access all the different systems that you that you want to manage of course including including your clients okay i hope this answers the question if not let me know Did you see the uh, follow-up? What if they are home or small business user in my break? It it may break. Wait, I'm no no ad. I don't. Okay. Did you see this? The uh, yeah. Um. I'm, well. Um. I'm not really sure. Um. So so I think so the the main the main thing for this kind of no, ah no AD ah okay okay. Um, yeah, okay. Um, you can, so I'm talking about AD, but the connection, there are two things. One is how can script runner connect to the system, like the client that you want to manage. So this is, this is where remoting jump hosts, things like that are, are, um, relevant. 
On the other side, when it comes to authenticate and you want to have a user be able to interact to trigger an action, then that could be something that is uh, maybe not AD related. So if you create a role in Script Runner, let's say a help desk or end user, then you have um, you have different um, different possibilities for authentication, and that also could be local. So meaning, if you have even if the script runner server maybe would be not part of an AD, maybe it's just uh, in a work group, so to speak, and you have a local user on the script runner machine, then that could be used for the the authentication as well. Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead. Yes. Mark. Okay. Yeah, so basically what it is, is let's say I've got a customer and I've got some, I, I do computer repair. And so, and I use uh, on some of them data, we used to be Autotask, Data RMM, and it runs P PowerShell scripts. One of the things I wanted to run, say, was, you know, people will call and say, my printer's not working because for some reason the um, computer went into uh, public, network went into public mode. And so I just wanted to run a script every once in a while that says, hey, is the network in public or private? And instead of trying to make a script that puts up a nice screen, I would be able to just use script runner. I think that's part of what it does is it creates a nice GUI. And so I can just put up a script with a GUI that just says, hey, are you at home or are you, you know, away? Because if you're at home yeah. for everything to work right, like your backups or, you know, printing or whatever, that if you're just at home, click yes, and we'll set the network back to the way it should be. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that that um, is kind of a different um, scenario for this, you know, cre creating a t uh, deleting a team's cache on a client. The only thing that, of course, is necessary in order to do that is that the the client is able or the user is able to connect to the script on a portal, so that the action so the, the user can authenticate and the user can can trigger the action. If that's possible, connection wise. Uh, then that's definitely a, a very valid use case for using script runner with, as you said, you know, having this just this tile with maybe just one parameter, private, public, and then everything else is done in the background with your underlying script. Absolutely. So it's not standalone, like maybe in the old day. I think I looked at script runner, but this was a long time ago before I really started getting into this. And it seemed like you guys had standalone stuff that was able to be done. Or maybe I didn't understand that correctly a couple three years ago yeah so i mean th again this comes back to the authentication so if you say okay there is a cent uh, of course you need to have a centralized script runner somewhere if okay. it's if it's something that um it's not part of an of an ad as i said you could say okay i'm defining the users that you for this use case as local users on the ad machine uh, on the sorry on the script on the machine mm -hmm. and then this we'll user can log in with this local them. user. But of course, that, yeah, I mean, I, I would say, okay, yeah. this would work maybe for 10, 20 users. If you are in a situation where you say, okay, this would be hundreds of users, then of course, the, maintaining that, of course, uh, as local users on this machine, not being part of an AD would be kind of a lot of work, I would say. So in these scenarios, uh, we typically see some, related somehow with with AD or Azure AD. Um, if it's a smaller number of users, I would say yes, use, use, using uh, local users is definitely fine. Um, or if you if you would like to have, let's say, let's say like a, um, yeah, a, let's say kind of a system user that everybody is using, so to speak. Uh, and that would be a local user on a script runner server not being part of AD or of, of domain then that would work as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. Very welcome. Thanks for your question. Good stuff. All right. So I think we're good to go. Thank you, Heiko. That was great. Thank um, you. Doug. You're welcome. My pleasure. Um, I've got some ideas, but we'll talk about them at another time. <laughs> Happy so, to do so. Absolutely. Awesome. So yeah, some really cool stuff I thought I saw, and uh, maybe we can chat and then uh, bounce some ideas off you. See if you think they make sense or I'm just out of my mind. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, really appreciate you hanging in there, joining. So if, I don't know if you still see the uh, link to my YouTube. I will post this up there, and uh, as well as others.
And I'm sure we'll have Heiko back at some point. Uh, maybe we'll talk more about ChatGPT. Yeah, we'd love to. Awesome. And more, and more ACDC, maybe. Always more <laughs> ACDC. <laughs> I, yeah, there was plenty of uh, hard rock names in your list there. I really uh, took me back. Yeah. You know, little heart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah so that's my thing so if you want to talk hard rock and heavy metal call me we'll give you a buzz <laughs> yeah. awesome all right we'll have a good one thanks for staying up late everybody else sure. my pleasure we'll catch you later and hopefully see you at another meetup take excellent. care excellent bye-bye bye thanks everyone